like to welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Hare Krishna. Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavari Pastyatyare Satarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, today is a kind of a, there's two days out of the month that devotees honor um, extra, uh, what they say, extra opportunities for spiritual growth. And these are called ekadasis, ekadasi. Eka means one, dasi means ten, ekadasi, ekadasi means ten. The 11th day before and after the waning and waxing moon. So this uh, two days of the month, 26 ekadasis throughout the year, are opportunities for spiritual growth. Um, as in every spiritual movement, there's always what we call uh, auspicious moments for greater spiritual gain. And today is one of those days. It's a day where there is, in India, the actual tradition is that one fasts the entire day uh, from all activities and including no food and no water also. It's called Nirjal. And on this day, one chants the, the holy name for 24 hours straight. <laughs> from the beginning of the Akadasi, which is usually just before the sunrise, until the following sunrise for 24 hours. And our spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, introduced Ekadasi into uh, our society, but not with such rigid strictures. He gave a little leadway. And that leadway is that we fast on this day from certain foodstuffs, such as no grains and no beans on this day, and then we increase our chanting and hearing on this day and decrease bodily activities. So it's an opportunity for spiritual growth, for Sikhadasi. And one of the great acharyas within the line of the Vaishnav uh, culture is Bhaktivinoda Thakur, and he says, Akadasi is the mother of devotion. So the best person in the family is the mother. And Anybody disagree with that? I mean, we uh, have Mother's Day and Father's Day. How many people actually remember Father's Day? We can just go. Oh, every day Mother's Day, everybody remembers Mother's Day. <laughs> so, you know, and it's actually a shakstra also. It says that the best, first person, the best person in the world is Krishna, second is the mother. Third is father. So in our life, we have a mother and father. But Krishna plays the role of both. He is what we say, Mata and Pita. Krishna Mata, Krishna Pita, Krishna Dana Pran. He's your life and soul. So, but within the Shastras, it talks about the glories of a mother. How a mother is honored in so many wonderful ways as a person who gives birth, gives life, and at the same time nourishes growth. Um, and so today is considered to be Ikadasi, which is the mother of devotion, the best day for spiritual growth. And what we do is we chant the holy names of the Lord. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Spiritual life consists essentially of glorifying the Lord. The Lord being the, pers the person who is the source of everything. He is the sinosaur of all activities. He is the, the be and end end of all activities. He's the purpose of everything. He's called Adi Purusha, that person from which everything comes. 
To glorify the Lord is natural. To glorify the Lord by chanting his holy name is the best way to glorify the Lord. <laughs> and this is mentioned in the Shastras. Iti soda sakam nam nam kali kama sanasa nam nata padateyo payo sarva vedashu drishyate. So, iti soda sakam nam nam kali kama So this, this is the age of kali. So according to Shastra, there are four ages. Satya Yuga, which is considered the golden age. Trekta Yuga, civil, civil, silver age. Um, Tupara Yuga, which is the bronze age. And Kali Yuga is the age, of, is called the iron age. In other words, this is the most difficult age of mankind. And why? Because very few people are actually interested in the goal of life, which is self-realization. Most people are interested in making money and enjoying their senses. This is, goes on as life in this age. To have material things, to enjoy your senses, and to accumulate wealth. <laughs> so this is a very bad age. It's not an age for spirituality, but Krishna has come in this age. Kali Kale Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar Nama Hoite Hoya Sarva Jagat Nishtara. He's come in this age, he descends in his form as the holy name. So in every age Krishna comes in different ways to what is called teach the religion of the age. So in Satya Yuga, which was called the Golden Age, mm -hmm. um, people live very long sometimes up to 100,000 years. You might say, how is that possible? But the atmosphere was pristine, and most people living on the earth planet were spiritually inclined. In fact, practically 99%, 99.9% of people were spiritually inclined. And so everything was blessed by the Lord, because when people perform devotional activities to the Lord, the atmosphere becomes very, what we say, pleasing. And people could live very long. There was very little sickness, hardly any. And uh, there was uh, nature worked in accordance with the seasons. Everything was in order. There was no, what we say, uh, activities outside of the normal routine. In other words, it says in, in such a yuga, it rained only at night <laughs> when there was at the time and then the next day the sun would come out and the rain would be used and the sun would nourish the environment after the rainfall. It would never rain during the day. <laughs> That's a feature of such a yuga. So people live very long and of course that age Valmiki Muni who wrote the Ramayana and Valmiki Muni lived 60,000 years. So, so that's a very auspicious age. And as time goes on, the ages change. And things become more and more materialistic. In the uh, Treta Yuga, uh, people lived less, less, and the means for self-realization was what is called Agnihotra. The fire sacrifices, um, performing the Agnihotra by offering ghee, grains, and various precious metals in sacrifice to the Lord with qualified priests, brahmanas, chanting mantras according to the Rik and Yajur Vedas, and um, chanting these mantras so perfectly that not even a, one syllable was missed in the chanting of the mantras. And uh, people would, uh, there was great amounts of wealth in the world, so people would bring their wealth to perform these sacrifices. Gold was an ordinary commodity. <laughs> Nowadays, you, you can't even buy gold, <laughs> even if you want to. <laughs> it's difficult. So, yes, it was, and people lived up to 10,000 years in that age. <laughs> And the means for self-realization was performing these Agnihotra sacrifices, as mentioned in the Vedas. And as time went on, 
the next stage came as Dwapara Yuga. And Dwapara Yuga was uh, a little less spiritually. People were still inclined spiritually, but a sense of arrogance and pride came into society, and people were highly qualified materially. And because of that, they were quite proud. <laughs> So there was an element of pride that came in there, but people were still very qualified. And the means for self-realization was to worship the deity. <laughs> um, we worship the deity in this age. Srila Prabhupada has established deity worship throughout the world in a very wonderful way, um, teaching us how to offer various articles and perform the ceremony of arti for the deity. But Prabhupada introduced deity worship as a side principle in order to support the actual principle of chanting the holy names. Because deity worship helps one to purify one's consciousness by seeing the Lord in his deity form, by offering prayers to the Lord, by offering gifts to the Lord, by, uh, just by seeing the Lord. One, one becomes spiritually uh, benefited. But in Dwarpa Yuga, the actual process for self-realization was deity worship. And what we do in our ISKCON society, in fact, throughout the world, is only 20% of the actual standard of deity worship. And deity worship was done on a very grand level, with great amounts of pomp and great amounts of opulences. People were highly qualified, mm -hmm. Brahmins. And uh, there was a lot of, uh, what we say, expertise in worshiping the deities. <laughs> Nowadays, we make so many mistakes. <laughs> to worship the deity properly is very difficult. <laughs> in other words, uh, there's a high, very high standard of cleanliness that is required to worship the deity, extremely high. <laughs> and, and people were highly qualified and followed the principles, you know, what we say to the T. And much, much opulences were used. And we have a nice altar, looks very decorative, but this is nothing compared to what was in Dwarpa Yuga. I mean, grand, grand, grand temples. And even today, some of the temples that exist today were, were actually constructed in the Dwarpa Yuga. <laughs> and so deity worship was the means for self-realization. But as time goes on, the ages change and man becomes more materialistically inclined. So now we are in the Kali Yuga. And Kali Yuga started 5,000 years ago. And in the scriptures it says that in this age, people cannot perform deity worship properly, nor Agni Hotra ceremonies, nor do meditation. Manda sumanda mateo manya bhagya upadrtaha. The people are very much disqualified for spiritual life in this age. <laughs> and therefore, and the Lord is very merciful. Knowing the disqualification of the age in terms of the people's, says that memory is reduced in this age. People forget. Just like if, you, if I ask you, what did you do at this time yesterday exactly? You'd have to think. <laughs> what if I asked you to do, what if I said one year ago? <laughs> Uh, you might say, well, that's impossible, what I did one year ago today at this. <laughs> well, but memory has reduced in this age a lot. Sometimes we, we can't, I know, I have in my own personal experience, somebody will introduce me to somebody and say, this is uh, Govinda. And then after talking to the person for two minutes, I'll say, what's your name again? I forgot. You know, we have a tendency to forget, easy. So memory is reduced a lot in this age. Bodily strength is greatly reduced in this age. People are weaklings. Sorry to say that. <laughs> when Krishna was on the battlefield in Kurukshetra, Krishna was 14 feet tall. Krishna was 14 feet tall, and the average warrior was between 18 and 20 feet tall. Krishna was a small guy <laughs> on the battlefield. <laughs> yeah, it's really, that's true. They've actually found some of the armor of the soldiers in the place called Kurukshetra. And they said that the armor is grand. There's even You can even go to some museums. They have that armor there. 
Bhima's club was found also, the actual club used by Bhima in Kurukshetra, and hardly anybody could even lift it, what to speak about, <laughs> speak about using it. So the and people were much, much more stronger physically and of course also mentally. So bodily f strength has been reduced drastically in this age. Uh, now we take all, we run around the block to get some energy, right? <laughs> we do exercises. We take this supplement, that medicine, this vitamin, this, this, this drink, right? <laughs> Trying to get some muscles, right? <laughs> We're always tired. <laughs> this is the age of Kali. Doctors really are very much more like the gurus in this age because everybody's sick. <laughs> everybody's sick. So this is a very difficult age for physical stamina, physical strength. This is Kali Yuga. Things have gone down. And what is else? Memory, physical strength, and mercy. People are not so merciful as they used to be. If someone was in trouble and someone could help immediately, that would be a natural instinct to try to relieve a person for and people were generally much more generous and kind in this age if we're kind if if it helps us <laughs> like they say sometimes they say when you want to give a present to somebody you look for something you don't need anymore and you and you give it away oh here's a nice gift for you i don't need it anymore <laughs> i'm sure you could use it <laughs> yeah you see, see radagopi balava So, uh, yeah, so mercy, kindness has been reduced. Uh, people are kind if it's good business. <laughs> it's good business. And then, of course, the ration of life is reduced. And people live up to 100 years. But how many people actually live to 100 years? That's considered to be nothing compared to the other ages where people live to 10,000, 100,000 years like that. So life is short, memory is reduced, bodily strength is reduced, mercy is reduced. Uh, what is increased and, and everything is, people are only interested in maintaining their bodies, that's all. <laughs> I can maintain my body nicely and my family nicely, I'm considered success in life. <laughs> but that is not the goal of life, nor is that success, because that's being done by the animals very successfully. So in this age, because it's such a difficult age for spiritual life, therefore Krishna has descended in his holy name, Kali Kale Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar. He's appeared in the age in, order, in a very simple and easy way, in the, in the sound vibration of, of himself. Krishna's name is Krishna. Just like we see the deity on the altar, and we say, oh, that is Krishna, and that is correct. And Krishna has manifested himself in his archavigraha form. Archavigraha form means that form that is worshipable and can be seen by others. <laughs> he appears within stone, within wood, within clay, within brass, various types of metals like that. And he enters into the deity and becomes the deity and accepts worship. So we know that, that's Krishna, when we see the deity. But we don't see the holy name. We can only chant the holy name. But the holy name is just as good, or we may, might say, even more merciful than the deity, because praying to the Lord in the form of the deity in this age means to get the mercy of the Lord through the holy name. If Krishna says, you want my mercy? Chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> You want my mercy, chant Hare Krishna. This is the way to get the mercy of the Lord and to elevate our consciousness to the spiritual realm. So these 16 names or 16 words, three names chanted, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna has appeared in the form of these names in this age. So his name is him. Uh, 
Nama Chintamani Krishnas Chaitanya Rasva Vigraha Purno Sudo Nitya Mukta Abhinna Twam Nami Nami No. So the word Binna means different, and Abhinna means that which is not different or the same. And the verse says, Abhinna Nami and Nama. So two things are mentioned, Nam and Nami. So Nam is the name and Nami is the person who is being named. So therefore the name and the person who is being named is the same. So Krishna, Krishna's name is Krishna. No difference. And Nam Nam Akardi Bahuda Nija Sarva Shaktis Lord Chaitanya who is Krishna himself in the parents as an incarnation of the Lord has said that all the energies, all the mercy, all the qualities, all the forms, everything is found in the name of Krishna. In other words, the full power of the absolute personality of Godhead is found in the sound of his name. <laughs> so nothing is lacking in them. But Rupa Goswami does something else. He says something very interesting. Srila Rupa Goswami, one of the main acharyas to teach the process of devotional service, says that Krishna is merciful, but there's somebody more merciful than Krishna. <laughs> Who is that? Krishna's name. So if we make an offense against Krishna, or we want the mercy of Krishna, we have to find it through the chanting of his name. In other words, they say time, sometimes we commit offense against God or we disobey his instructions. So to get a relief from that, what we say, reaction, then to chant the holy name means to become free from the reactions like that. So the holy name is very merciful because it only, not only delivers Krishna, but it frees one from all material sufferings and all material anxieties like that. So this is the mercy in this age, is to chant the holy names of the Lord. But people don't want to chant for some reason. They think either it's too easy, they have no time, or um, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when our spiritual master was here many years ago, uh, the devotees at that time showed him a cartoon from one newspaper. And there was a cartoon was one old lady and old man, husband and wife are together. And the old lady is saying to her husband, chant, chant, chant. And the husband is saying, can't, can't, can't. So he can say can't, but he won't say Krishna. <laughs> so... So this is the problem. <laughs> so therefore, and by chanting, you develop a taste for chanting. This is the, this is the mercy of the holy name. When we, when we absorb ourselves practicing chanting, we develop a, a taste because chanting is very sweet. Chanting brings about a sense of peace and happiness within the mind and heart and frees one from anxiety and, and gives one what we say knowledge. That knowledge which helps us to understand God and to live in this world. So Krishna's name is complete. It manifests. Uh, there's one very beautiful statement in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the second canto where Srila Prabhupada writes, he says, by chanting the holy names of the Lord, one can synchronize all stipula stipulated energies from everywhere. Uh, by chanting the holy names of the Lord, one can synchronize all stipulated energies from all parts of existence. Mm -hmm. In other words, you actually become the center of the universe when you're chanting. <laughs> You draw the energies towards you, positive energies, not negative energies like that. Why? Because you are associating with Krishna through his name. It's to chant his name means to associate with him directly, not, not what we say through some indirect process like that. So when you're, 
when you're actually chanting the holy name. So he practiced to chant. Um, the bodhis chant japa on beads. We chant 16 rounds on beads. Each bead, each round has 108 names on the 108 beads. So 16 times 108, it's like, how much is that? 1,728, right? That's 1,728 mantras multiplied by 16 again is something like 27,000 so many names per day. And that, that's the minimum. So on a codice, like today, we chant 24 hours. So. <laughs> At least we should, <laughs> or try to. So it becomes, a, it becomes an affair of the heart, and the mind becomes satisfied and peaceful like that. The only problem is the mind always wants to do something else. <laughs> right? We see, see the tendency of the world today is to think success is by doing things. <laughs> If you can do something and it becomes successful, that's your success. Or if you can get something that you want, that's also success. But actually, these are what we say lower forms of success. The highest form of success is to build our spiritual character. Because as you have spiritual character, you have value. When you have value, what you have and what you can do has greater amounts of gain and profit in your life. So therefore, character, spiritual character, is developed through chanting. More and more like that. And you attract Krishna. <laughs> you can attract Krishna through the sound of his name. Right? People are trying to attract each other, right? Boy is trying to attract girl. Girl is trying to attract boy. And this goes on in the world today, right? And somebody's trying to attract the attention or the good favor of another person so they can get something from them, some remuneration, some position, something. Or people are trying to, you know, become attractive because they feel good if they're, if they're attractive, right? <laughs> so, but attracting, you know... Now, you, a person might say, if I can attract the President of the United States, wouldn't that be wonderful? That would be a great success. He's a big person, right? Or the President of any country. But that person who creates all the Presidents <laughs> and empowers the Presidents to do whatever they want, how about attracting him? <laughs> Compared to these other Presidents, they're, he, they, you know, they're insignificant. So to attract God is the greatest form of developing, you know, we say, attraction or relationship. So chanting the holy name actually attracts the attention of Krishna. Krishna says, oh, they're chanting my name. Then for, let me give that person my mercy, like that. So Krishna becomes pleased. Even if your chanting is not perfect, still, Krishna is pleased by the effort like that. Like that. So that's Krishna. He's very merciful. And so we practice this chanting. There's a beautiful story in the Mahabharata spoken by... Uh, which describes at the end of the battle of Kurukshetra, after the Pandavas had become victory over the Kurus, King Yudhisthira was placed upon the throne. And King Yudhisthira, now being the king of the entire world, wanted to benefit the citizens as much as possible. And so being a worthy king and knowing his position as a king, he had an open-door policy that anyone in the kingdom that would like to see him and speak to him directly, they could come. <laughs> of course, nowadays, you, it's very difficult if you wanted to see the, you know, the head of state. And most of the time, you would never get a chance to unless you had some very personal business with him. But the king, the head of state, according to Vedic culture, or the standard for Vedic rule, was that the king was like the father, and the citizens were like the praja, or the, what we say, children. So the king would rule from that point, that let me, let me always take care of the needs of the citizens. 
They would exact taxes, but the taxes would always be used for the citizens' benefit and not to fill the pockets of the leaders like today. <laughs> so although taxes were exacted, still everything went back to the welfare of the citizens like that. That was Vedic rule. And kings were also guided by spiritual principles, not that they simply ruled by materialistic principles. So King Yudhisthira was such a king. So he made a program. Anyone that would come would like to see me, please come. So one day, one man arrives, and uh, Bhima, the brother of Yudhisthira, was sitting in front of the door, just watching the door, anyone who would want to come. So they would have to approach Bhima first. So this man said, my dear Bhima, I need to see Yudhisthira. I have to talk to him. I got this problem. Well, Bhima said, well, actually, he's quite busy. Um, maybe you can just tell me, maybe I can help you. All right. He said, well, actually, I decided to make a nice garden. And so I got many nice flowers and planted others, shrubs and some, some bushes. And, and I did a lot of plant, cultivating. I made this beautiful garden. It was so nice, varieties of flowers and trees and shrubbery. And, and then I was thinking, I need something to protect the garden. So I decided to build a wall around the garland. So I built a wall. And after I finished building the wall around the garden, the most amazing thing happened. The, gar the wall started to encroach on the garden and destroy the garden. I couldn't figure it out. I built a wall to protect the garden, and now the garden is being destroyed by the wall. I need to speak. I, Bhima said, well, sounds like a problem for you to steer. You go in. So the man walks in. Next man comes. He says, oh, Bhima, problem. I have to see you to steer. Um, Bhima said, well, I think he's there talking with someone else. Maybe I can help you. Okay. Well, it's not a problem, but it was kind of like a bewilderment. I had this big bucket of water, and I decided to take the bucket and put it into different cups. So I, had, I filled up five huge cups with this bucket. There was no water left in the bucket. The cups were filled to the top, and then I decided to take the cups and pour them back into the bucket. And when I did, and I didn't spill any, the bucket was only half filled. I started with a full bucket, put it into five cups, didn't spill any water, put it back in, it was only half filled. Can you explain? Uh, Bhima said, I think you should speak to Yudhisthira about this. <laughs> so, so a third man comes. And he said, oh, Bhima, i got to see you this there. This is, this is amazing. Oh, I just saw something you wouldn't believe, and I need an explanation for that. Well, Bhima said, you know, you know uh, I'll give me a try. <laughs> so he said, all right. I saw this elephant, huge elephant, gigantic elephant, and he was walking, and he was walking, and he was walking right towards this big wall. A big wall, big elephant. And he walks, and he goes right into the wall, keeps walking forward, crashes through the wall. The wall breaks, and he goes all the way through, except his little tail gets stuck at the end. Big elephant goes right through the wall, and his little tiny tail gets stuck. Can you explain? Bhima said, uh, I think I should have stayed home today. <laughs> Can't figure this one out either. <laughs> so he said, maybe you go, over and go in and see Yudhisthira. <laughs> okay, so he goes in. Fourth man comes. He said, Bhima, and I just want to talk to Yudhisthira. I want a little explanation of what I just experienced. It's not so bad, but it's quite amazing, in fact. Bhima said, all right, let, give me a try. I know he's busy with other people. He said, the man said, well, I thought, you know, I, was not, I wasn't doing anything today, had nothing to do, so I decided to go someplace I'd never been before. So I just started walking, and walking and walking, and I wanted to go to an area which was new. 
But as I was walking, I noticed things were changing, and the, the atmosphere was becoming very, very, what we say, uh, what we say, foreboding, very, what we say, heavy with darkness. And then as I was walking, and walking was becoming darker and darker, and all I could see around me, everything else was gone, but there was only mountains. And everything was made of stone. They were all rock mountains. And I was looking around, it was rocks on the ground, rocks everywhere, rocks around me. The sky was dark, and I was frightened. I was thinking, where am I? How did I ever get here? Let me get out of here. So I started to run, thinking, let me just run, maybe I can run out of here. But everywhere I ran to, it was the same. And then finally, as I was running, I looked down and I saw something unusual. I saw this beautiful little green plant growing out of the, the rocks from the ground. I thought, that's unusual. There's nothing else around except this one little green plant. So I pulled it just to see what it was. And as soon as I pulled it up, it came out and everything changed. The darkness was gone, the mountains were gone, the sunlight came out and it was like beautiful day and I felt so happy. Can you explain? <laughs> Uh, Bhima said, um, well, so far I haven't got one right yet today. So. Anyway, you go in and see Yus there. So he goes in. So after some time, Bhima comes walking in to Yudhisthira's office, and he's all by himself. There's anybody, nobody there. So Bhima said, did you see those four men that I sent in? Yudhisthira said, what four men? I didn't see any four. Oh, those four men. <laughs> oh, S sorry about that. <laughs> Soon, uh, I, I apologize. <laughs> I usually do that to wake people up, just in case anybody was sleeping. <laughs> You're okay? Okay, good, thank you. Send me the medical bill. <laughs> those four, he said, those four men. My God, soon Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, will leave the planet and Kali Yuga will begin. It'll be such a difficult time for people. Those four men represent Kali Yuga. Can you explain their story, Bhima asked? Yes, Yudhisthira said the first man, the man with the garden. The garden represents the people and the wall represents the government. So people will elect the government officials for protection, but the government will destroy the people. Kali Yuga. Good luck in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> the second man, the, the man with the buckets and the cups, Yudhisthira said, oh, this is so sad, so sad. The mothers, the fathers will try to take care of their children and give them the best that they can possibly give in their life. But the children will not appreciate what their parents give them. The bucket starts filled, it goes back half filled. The children will not be able to really appreciate or reciprocate what their, what their parents give them. Kali Yuga. The third one, the, the elephant and the wall. Yudhisthira said, yes, this is unfortunate. If you have money, you can get justice. If you have money, you can get justice. If you're a poor man, even if you're innocent. Uh, just yesterday, I went to see one man in jail. Because he doesn't have money, the whole process of what we say, his appeal for his case, is really being stymied just because he's not wealthy. If you have money, you can buy justice. So the rich man, even if he's a criminal, he buys his way out of the justice, through the justice. A poor man, even may he be, may be innocent because he has no money. He's victimized. So this is Kali Yuga. And the last one, Yudhisthira said, this is interesting. The darkness, the rocks, all that represents Kali Yuga, Manda Sumanda Mateyo. In this age, everything is very difficult. That little green creepy, creeper, that's the holy name. 
That's the holy name. So that is the benediction in this age. That if we want to destroy the effects of this age, uh, even the, re the effects of our next election, you can even destroy that. <laughs> Chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> In other words, the holy name protects one from the effects of the material energy. One is insulated and one is protected by the, the, the difficulties in this age, by Krishna's mercy coming through his holy name. So chanting the holy name is the panacea. This is the word that was used by his divine grace. Panacea means the cure for all ills. Mm -hmm. If you have a particular pill that you take and all diseases could be destroyed simply by this one pill. I think doctors are still trying to find that one pill. <laughs> one thing that can destroy all illness. Um, well, this is the holy name. It can destroy all the evils and inauspicious things of this age. But that's just a side benefit. The actual benefit of chanting the holy names, it brings one to Krishna like that. Like that. Krishna shows his mercy to those who chant his holy names. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. And the scriptures say, Satatam Kirtayantum Mam. Chant the holy names as much as possible. Devotees chant 16 rounds as a, what we say, as a vrata, an austerity. But that is just to get a taste. So the more you chant, the more you want to chant. So chant always the holy names of the Lord, and one will always be in the best position, materially and spiritual. Mm -hmm. That is the mercy of God in this age. That is the mercy. It's a very direct, simple, but very powerful form of mercy. Okay, so in today's Ekadasi, the Ekadasi day is an opportunity to chat more and more and more like that. Any questions or comments on chanting Hare Krishna? Anybody want to give some realizations of their own chanting, how it's helped them in their life, experiences? The tie? Well, I think um, when I first started chanting years ago, um, I had a desire that I wanted to quit, quit meat. I quit eating meat. Mm -hmm. I remember my brother saying that just try chanting four rounds for one month to see what happens. And then I tried that. I was walking by Charles River, uh, right in Kendall Square. And, uh, Something in my heart, and I said, well, no, I ain't eating. And I grew up eating a lot of... Yeah, well, that's normal. All of a sudden. So, yeah, the chanting will attack, uproot those desires. Mm -hmm. And at one point, it's not a matter of decision anymore. It's a matter of just, well, this is what I want to do. <laughs> It becomes a, an attraction. Yeah. That's the power of Krishna's name. <laughs> Anything else? That's nice. Thank you very much. So that's a very important point. To experience something we want to do, although it may be difficult, the mercy of the holy name helps. Not helps, but actually does it itself. <laughs> yes, Bhima. <laughs> Um, the day is divided into different mo um, energies, and the, mo the, the energy in the morning is a more meditative energy. Throughout the day, activity is more conducive to life. So the morning time is very conducive for chanting. And uh, especially what is called the Brahma Mohorta hour, which is an hour and a half before sunrise. It's the best time to begin chanting like that. Like that. That's and, and then it's a foundation. By chanting early, we set the, the pattern for the rest of the day. Also, so early is 
not only auspicious, but highly recommended by all the saints and sages. Getting up early enough to pray, to chant like that. The mind is somewhat unencumbered by the thoughts of the activities of the day. So the morning hours are conducive for meditation, for prayer, like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. On a personal level, would it be that uh, because we make chanting, calling Krishna's name the priority that the Krishna makes, that because we have set that this uh, sacrifice is the priority of the day, Krishna responds accordingly? Well, his response is that uh, the power of his name gives what is called clarified vision. It helps you to understand how to do things throughout the day. Krishna's name is all auspicious. His, his mercy is that he... His mercy is that he gives himself in the form of his name. But the side benefit is he frees one from anxiety, suffering, and uh, helps one to guide one throughout the rest of the day. Yes. The holy name is all, is all auspicious. So chant Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.